Today we're going to be learning about something really interesting, animal poems. Now you might be wondering why a 12-year-old is teaching you about this. Well, my name, as I said before, is Doris Fetalk, and at the age of seven, I published my first book, Flying Fingers, Master the Tools of Learning, Do the Joy of Writing, and this is my first book. It contains some of my short stories. Now my second book, which is a little more relevant to the topic that we're going to be talking about today, is called Dancing Fingers, Selected Poems and Writing Inspirations from Two Sisters. And this is the poetry book that I co-authored with my older sister, Adriana. So I really love to write poetry, and if you have a copy of Dancing Fingers, then uh, uh, there's a part in here called Feathers, Horns, and Claws. So any guesses what a section called Feathers, Horns, and Claws might be about? Wait, excuse me one minute. The, the volume is going in and out, kind of. We can't it is? Really it goes in and out. That's um. Let me see. Uh, I have my, my little microphone thing right here. Is this any better? Just, yes. Okay, let me know if it does that again. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, this, I, in my poetry book, there's a section that's called Feathers, Horns, and Claws. So any guesses what a section called Feathers, Horns, and Claws might be about? The and Animals, exactly, very good. And that's what we're going to be learning about today. Dancing Fingers, Animal Poems 101. Just getting this uh, full screen here. Great, so writing animal poems. Now one of the reasons that I really like to write about animals is that there are millions of species of animals in the world. So you'll it's going to be really hard to run out of ideas. Who wants to throw out some animals? One tail. An eagle. An eagle? Very Cameron. good. Cameron. Leopard. A leopard? Mm hmm. It's all right. A black bear. A black bear? Yes. Bradley. A shoe. A, a sorry? A cheetah. Oh, a cheetah? Yeah, definitely. So, as you can see, there are so many animals that we can just think of off the top of our head. I can think of guinea pigs, cats, dogs, hamsters, gerbils, uh, gerbils, rabbits. You can see I'm kind of thinking of lots of rodent animals here. But there are really millions of species of animals in the world, so it's going to be hard to run out of ideas. So here's tip number one. Every animal you look at, remember, imagine, or see in a picture or on TV can be a source of inspiration for poetry. Anyone want to tell me what inspiration is? Javon? It gives you an idea to start. Exactly. It gives you ideas. So an inspiration would give us ideas, and animals can do exactly that. So, for instance, here's a poem that I wrote. It's called My Dog Daisy. I don't actually have a dog, but that's one of the cool things also about writing animal poems. You can imagine that you had a pet you don't have. Grandma fed the dog today. The beast went super crazy. Grandma said she fed her hay. Oh, dear, my poor dog Daisy. If I had fed the dog instead, she wouldn't have gone so crazy. But Grandma fed her liquid lead and crazed my poor dog Daisy. So that is a poem about um, kind of this dog. It's, it's entirely fictional, so I made it up. But it's about a dog that, that unfortunately um, went kind of crazy because it ate something it wasn't supposed to, uh, thanks to my grandma feeding it. And you can make up stories about the animals you see in real life. So obviously dogs are real. We see them walking around. But I made up that story entirely. You can use an animal as a metaphor to talk about something completely different. Anyone want to tell me what a metaphor is? Let me kind of watch the definition. Anybody? Anybody want to tell what a metaphor is? Okay. Oh, I see a hand in there. Comparing. Comparing. It's comparing. Very good. Well, a metaphor is something that is used to represent something or someone else. So what would an eagle be a metaphor for? Bradley, the United States. Exactly. Yeah. Eagles are
are metaphors for the United States. So we use lots of symbols, we use lots of metaphors in our everyday life and in the stuff that we talk about. And you can use metaphors in your poetry as well. So for instance, just like an eagle represents the United States, you could use some kind of animal to talk about something completely different. So let's practice. Uh, let's say I have a tiger. What do you think this, uh, what do you think a tiger might be a metaphor for? Strength. 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 Very good. A tiger might be a metaphor for strength, since they're very strong. What else might it be a metaphor for? Power. Power. Yeah, definitely. A lot of the big cats, like lions and tigers, cheetahs, leopards, they could all probably be used to represent strength. Maybe agility, so that means you can like move around really easy. Um, maybe speed as well, like a cheetah, you could use it to represent speed, since obviously they're very fast. So you can use animals as metaphors to talk about something completely different in your poem. If you want to talk about something that scares you without talking about it directly, you could instead write about an animal that has the same qualities as the thing that scares you. So let's say you are, what are people scared of here? Snakes. 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 Okay, so you're scared of an animal itself. Right, you could easily write a, a poem about a snake. Uh, yeah, so if you have animals that you're scared of, like mice or snakes or bears or sharks, you could write poems about those. Uh, let's think about things that aren't animals that we're scared of. Hi, Dan. Hi. definitely uh, agree with that, that one. Um, now, what kind of animal could you maybe use to sort of represent your fear of heights? I agree. you have an idea for it? A bird. A bird? Yeah. Maybe you could, kind of, you could maybe kind of contrast, like, looking up at the bird in the sky, maybe how you get jealous because they're not scared of heights. You could do something like that. That might be interesting. Yeah, so you can really use animals. You could play off one of their qualities and wish that you had it, or you could use an animal to sort of represent the same things that you're scared of. Yeah, there are lots of different things you can do with that. Uh, for example, let's say you want to write about war or a natural disaster, so maybe I am really scared of hurricanes. Then you could write a poem about a large animal that devours everything in its path. So if I was writing about how terrible hurricanes were and how scared I was of hurricanes, instead of just writing a poem directly about I'm scared of hurricanes, I could write something about a large animal that devours everything in its path, and the idea is what's a large animal that devours everything in its path. A crocodile, yeah, that might be a good one. A crocodile, um, maybe a really scary big animal. Yeah, I could use lots of. I, what What are some other big animals that eat everything? A gorilla. A very uh, a bear. A bear, great. So I could use any one of those to write about my being scared of hurricanes without saying that directly. That's kind of using that metaphor. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you can definitely put animals to great use in your poetry. And then to let readers know what you are really talking about, you could title the poem after the real thing that scares you, not the animal. So uh, just to show you, let's say I was to write that poem about being scared of hurricanes, but, oops, I need to open up the page. Okay, so I was to write that um, something about being scared of hurricanes, but using an animal instead. So I might title it Hurricane. Let me make this a little bigger. And then write, the big brown bear eats everything. It never stops to think. And um, let's see, what what should my next lines be? Uh -huh. A bear what it eats. A bear what? A bear what it eats. Never stops to think about what it eats. So it never stops to think about what it eats. Okay, about what, what it eats. It never stops to think about what it eats. Trying to think 
I'm saying that rhymes with think. Think. Think about what it eats. And then he's a very giant stink. Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> um, so if you think about a hurricane, we're using this big brown bear to represent the hurricane. So the big brown bear eats everything and never stops to think about what it eats, and then it leaves a very giant stink. Okay, so there we go. If you think about it, what we're talking about the big brown bear doing is what a hurricane would do, right? So a hurricane, it blows in, it knocks everything over, it eats everything. It doesn't stop to think about what it's doing. It's a hurricane. And then it leaves a very giant stink. It's kind of destruction, the flooding. Or, you know, if, if any of you have seen a hurricane talk about on the news, then you know kind of what happens in the wake of one. And Yes? You could use that example of a big brown bear or a gorilla or whatever type of animal that eats everything in its path. Okay, great. So back to the presentation. You could write a poem about your pet. Raise your hand if you have a pet. I'm seeing some raised hands. Great. Who would like to tell me about their pet? Oh, I have a 
some pictures if you have some pictures maybe of bobcats tigers cheetahs if you see them maybe on a wall um another thing is you can uh ask other people maybe who have seen them in the zoo or something uh and, and ask them about what they look like so yeah you could definitely write a poem about a bobcat tiger cheetah okay you could write poems about the things that scare you as we talked about and then use animals as a metaphor to kind of represent that. Like we use the big brown bear to represent the hurricane. And when you write about animals, you have the chance to use lots of descriptive words and action words. Why would we want to use descriptive words and action words in our poem? To describe them. To describe them? Okay, so why do we want to describe the animals? Um, it makes it sound interesting. It makes it sound interesting. Really good. Yeah. When you describe, it makes it sound more interesting. And imagine. Um, so let's see. I have this tiger here, and I can see it. But I, but you have to remember that not everyone who reads your poem can see the tiger. Not everyone who reads your poem knows exactly what this tiger in your poem is going to look like unless you describe it. And what's sometimes really fun to do for writing a poem is you could describe one part at a time. So, for instance, you could say the orange ear or something like that and really go in depth and describe that, the shimmering ear or something like that. Um, just going kind of step by step all around the tiger. That could be fun. So be sure to describe your animal so that the person reading your poem knows exactly what it looks like, has that image in their head, and then make it interesting. What about action words? Anyone want to give me an example of an action word? Example of an action word or action verb. Uh, running. Okay, I think we find something more interesting than that. Let's go. Demarcus. Devouring. 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 That one's a good one. Uh, what are some other ones? Anyone else? He said devouring. Any other action words to describe the animals? Erica. Leaping. Leaping, very good. What is the tiger doing when it goes like that? Jumping or he's jumping, maybe. Maybe if there's someone he's lunging. Lunging, very good. He's lunging. He's lunging forward. He's pouncing on something. Oops. Uh, he might he might leap from one place to another. Yeah, so those are all good action words. If if an animal was, was really mad, they might snarl or hiss. So you can use words like these to really make your poem flow and sound good. By the way, um, raise your hand if you how many of you have written some poems before? I'm seeing a lot of raised hands. Great. So, uh, raise your hand to tell me what are some of your favorite words to use in poems. Favorite words to use in poems. Raise your hand if you have some favorite words you use in your poems. Brad. Thank you. 
a chance to use a lot of those words. And when you want to really convey the pouncing or the leaping, you want to have the reader be able to see that in their head to really get the message of your poem across. So uh, writing about animals really gives you a chance to do that. You could describe an animal's sleek coat, its glimmering scales, or its glowering eyes. Here's tip number two. Try taking things one step further. Discover new words to describe your animal. First, pick an animal, animal you want to write about. So let's think of an animal you want to write about. Any ideas? A panda. Okay, great. So here we have our topic, panda. Then you could look up the animal in an encyclopedia, a science book, or a website such as National Geographic Animals, which is what we're going to do right now. So I'm going to head over to uh, National Geographic Animals and look up panda. They have a pretty cool little quick find thing. Uh, in animals A to Z. So right now it's loading information of panda. Pause. I'll just scroll down. Okay. And you will see lots of really interesting animals scrolling down, like the oriental fire-bellied toad, which I have never heard of before. Here we go. really odd. It doesn't look like they have it in here. Which is strange. They have all the... Very strange. Let me look. Ah, here we go. Giant panda or red panda? Giant panda. Okay, that's good. That's the one that's like black and white. Not um, so that's Okay, so here we go. Here's a picture of a panda. It's eating its bamboo, it looks like. And so we can read a little bit about it and get some new words for it. The giant panda has an insatiable appetite for bamboo. Anyone know what insatiable means? Unstoppable. Unstoppable, exactly. So what we could do now is I like the word insatiable. I think it describes pretty well. It's an unstoppable. Okay. So I'm going to write that one down. Insatiable along with unstoppable. So both there. Pretty good describing words. Going back from the animal. Okay. So the giant panda has an insatiable appetite for bamboo. A typical animal eats half the day, a full 12 out of 24 hours. Imagine you spent half of your day eating. And it relieves itself dozens of times a day. That means it goes poop <laughs> a lot. Um, it takes 28 pounds of bamboo to satisfy a giant panda's daily dietary needs and it hungrily plucks the stalks. Kind of nice word, hungrily plucks. Uh, so going, and, and as you read through an article about an animal that you want to write about, you can really uh, find all these cool words. Okay, wild pandas live only in remote mountainous regions in central China. These high bamboo forests are cool and wet, just as pandas like it. Pandas are often seen eating in a relaxed, sitting posture, with their hind legs stretched out before them. They may appear sedentary, but they are skilled tree climbers and efficient swimmers. Giant pandas are solitary. They have a highly developed sense of smell that males use to avoid each other and find females in the spring. Um, well, okay. Um, oh, and then the infants weigh only five ounces at birth and cannot crawl until they reach three months of age. Okay, great. So we've uh, found a, another good word, solitary. Solitary, and you know what that means? Stick to it. Stick, yeah, just kind of staying alone, not really meeting up with other pandas. They just stay where they are. Okay, so we have some words, insatiable, unstoppable, hungrily, flux, solitary. Alrighty, so I'm going to write, um, like, the first thing now, and, and then we can, can, and then you guys can continue with it. Okay, so, panda, that's what we're going to title it for now. Let me make the font bigger. 
solitary in the in the mountains I roam. Remote regions of China, my home. Okay, here's here are the first two lines. Solitary in the mountains I roam. Remote regions of China, my home. So I've already used solitary. Um, how can we mix in insatiable, unstoppable, hungry flux? Well, what should the next few lines say about the panda? Very on. Very on. <laughs> I am insatiable when I see bamboo. I am very good. I am insatiable when I see bamboo. Okay, I have the worst thought right now. It's really gross. <laughs> I think you all know what it was. <laughs> Um, it, it says the giant panda is an insatiable appetite for bamboo. A typical animal eats half the day and relieves itself dozens of times a day. So you know what I thought rhymed with bamboo, but I don't know. Is that too gross? Okay, I am insatiable when I see bamboo. How should I phrase that?
Panda. Solitary in the mountains I roam, remote regions of China my home. I am insatiable when I see bamboo. My full stomach <laughs> makes me poo, okay? <laughs> Forget that I just said that. But I must eat for half the day. At bamboo, I hungrily pluck away. I'm really shy and I go it alone. I really like that quiet tone. I really like to roam around. I wish there was a panda town. Now look at this poem. Uh, what is a word that I used a lot in here, that we use a lot in here? Really, yeah. Um, so we might, because it gets a little repetitive, it means we used it, we used it one, two, three times. Let me see. Yeah, three times. So what do you think we could replace them with? Maybe. I really like to roam around. I wish there was a pan. Okay, that's all better. Great. So, that's the poem that we wrote. And see, you get an idea of wild animal you like. Panda, look it up. See, uh, you find some words you like. Insatiable, unstoppable, uh, whatever else. Let's see. What were some of the other words? Let me see. Okay, we add insatiable, unstoppable, hungrily plucks, and solitary. And then with those words, you can just deposit them in your poem. And you don't necessarily have to use all of them. We, we used all of them, but you could just use them to kind of as a jumping off point. Whatever you feel best to you. So uh, writing a poem about a wild animal by doing some research and then finding cool words to describe it, that can be a really fun activity to do. You could also write all the words that scientists use to describe the animal and its habitats and make a list of really scientific words. So here is activity number one that you could try at home. Choose an animal, find writing about the animal in an encyclopedia or science book magazine or website, and write a list of words scientists use to describe the animal and its habitat, then write a poem using some of the words. So those are a few steps uh, that, that we actually kind of took. We went to National Geographic Animals, and then we read about the pan and we took some of those words. So you can write down this activity uh, to do at home. Because choosing the animal, you probably already know to do that, and you also know to write a poem already. So you, the important part is go to or research animal, write a list of words, describe the animal. Pretty simple. Just write that down. Okay, great. So moving along now. Um, when we write poems about animals, we do get to use those exciting action words like pounce and prance, snort and snarl. The ones we were talking about were more adjectives, more describing words, but we can use a lot of these action words as well. So here's a poem that I, uh, that I wrote. It's called Wolf, and it's really dramatic, very dramatic, and I use lots of action words to kind of make it like that. So this one is called Wolf. My paws walk over earth and stone. I call the wild my only home. My teeth will break the thickest bones. I howl in the moonlight alone. My feet tap by the haunted mirror. My howl the common folk can hear. And when they know that I am near, they shiver in their climbing fear. 
My howling run through the streets, my rush at the coward's feet, my mad desire for bloody meat, and then, in the darkness, I retreat. So that's my poem, Wolf, and it's pretty dramatic. Obviously, not all wolves behave like that, but uh, if you look carefully for the kind of action words, so the verbs and stuff, then my teeth will break the thickest bone. I howl in the moonlight alone. Uh, and my feet tapped by the haunt of me are howl, uh, shiver, and climbing fear. So all of these words, imagine if you took out all of these words. It probably wouldn't be quite as scary or quite as dramatic. So action words can really contribute a lot to your poem. Here's tip number three. To practice writing action words, you could try writing an animal poem that doesn't use the words is, was, or were. Now this is, would be really difficult but the reason that you might want to try that is because uh, when you use uh, words like is, was, or were, sometimes you can be replacing that with a more interesting action word. And so practicing that is quite fun and a little bit difficult. And here's activity number two that you could try. Choose an animal you want to write about and write a list of interesting action words that could be used to describe the animal. So for instance, feet tapping by the haunted mirror, howling, all of those are pretty fun. So very similar to the last activity that I shared with you. More activities that are fun to try. Write a poem about your pet. Next time your pet is acting up or being annoying, just look at it and think, and write down some notes and think, hmm, maybe I could write a poem about that instead of getting annoyed at them. Write a poem about your ideal imaginary pet. Raise your hand if you don't have a pet. I see some raised hands. Yeah, for a long time, I didn't have a pet either. And so my sister and I, we would just kind of have these dreams about our ideal pets. And um, so, yeah, you can do that in your poem. Write a poem about the rampage of a formerly meek and mild animal. So an animal that's maybe suddenly just gone on a ramp. Uh, using specific action words, you could write a poem about a wild animal on the hunt. Write a poem that uses an animal as a metaphor, like we did, the big brown bear represent the hurricane. Uh, using specific action words, write about something that scares you using an animal. You could write a poem about the way a certain animal's coat, their skin feels. Or using specific action words, write a poem about the way a certain animal moves. So obviously you don't have to do all of these, but these are some fun activities that you can always try if you feel like writing an animal poem. And uh, another thing I wanted to mention is if any of you have a copy of Dance Mirrors or if you want one, you can go to my website, adorasvtalk.com, and then the section you will want to go to for all the animal poems is the one with the picture of the wolf and the butterfly, etc. on the front, and that one is called Feathers, Horns, and Claws. Okay, so... Um, now that we have come to the end of the presentation, I just want to know who would like to tell me one thing they've learned today. National Geographic, they have the quick find, an, or the, sorry, the animals A to Z. So if you go to nationalgeographic.com slash animals, they'll have all the animals and lots of information about them. All poems don't have to rhyme. All poems don't have to rhyme. Yeah, not all poems have to rhyme. Actually, uh, that's one of the things we, we did write rhyming poems today, but you could just as easily whip up a poem that doesn't rhyme. Uh, and sometimes it's a little easier because, uh, sorry, uh, sometimes it's a little easier actually because remember how hard it was to rhyme, or, well actually it wasn't too hard, but rhyming around, we kind of did a funny rhyme, panda tent. Yeah, so you don't always have to do that. You could just as easily write a non-rhyme poem. And there are lots of different kinds of poems, haiku, free verse, sonnets, and you uh, can explore really lots of different types. What are you Oh, you think I'll be tough to write about? You learn how to 
can think of a topic, look it up, look some different animals up. Thank you very much. Yes. That was good. 